Hello, everybody, and welcome to Commodity Culture, where our goal is to make you a better investor in the commodity space. My name is Jesse Day. Before we dive in, standard disclaimer, nothing here is investment advice. Do your own due diligence. And today's guest is the owner of ARC Silver, Gold, Osmium, and a keen enthusiast of the precious metals space. It's Ian Everard. Great to have you back on the show. Great to be here, Jesse. Thank you. Thank you for coming on again. And I want to start, as I often do, with a broader overview, this time honing in on gold and silver. What are the main themes and trends that you're currently watching when it comes to the precious metal space that you think maybe more people should be paying attention to? Yeah, I mean, a few people have been mentioning it. I think definitely the, the flow eastwards, uh, particularly silver, the arbitrage there is huge. So I've heard some people saying different amounts, $2, $3 per ounce higher on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. So I checked this morning. I pulled up today's PM fix. So the date of recording this is the 30th of uh, May. And I did the calculations from the figure on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. And I have confirmed that it is a net figure. It doesn't include any purchase tax or anything. And the figure comes out at, as of today, silver is $3.89 more expensive per ounce in Shanghai. Uh, and that seems, it seems impossible. I mean, $3.89, there's very few silver products that we charge that as the total premium. And obviously that premium includes our premium, the wholesaler's premium, possibly a primary wholesaler's premium, and the mint's premium. So at the moment, in the U.S., you can buy a refined product, whether it's a, a British Britannia, for less per ounce than in China if you're buying 1,000-ounce bars. So this is must be having a dramatic pull on the silver spot price, much more so, I think, than uh, Western uh, retail demand. And what's the reason for this arbitrage, as far as you can make sense of it? Well, it seems that the market's bifurcated. There's two markets. There's the price in Shanghai, and there's a price, price, price. So does that mean we're not actually getting true price discovery yet on the COMEX, very closely tied with the LBMA? Um, you know, people who, I think there's one bank, banker who's in prison at the moment he was also on the board of the lbma so we're not speculating that there is not just collusion but active participation in the in the institutions that are supposed to be responsible for market discovery they seem to be doing the opposite in the west so we're not actually getting true market discovery of the price of silver and do you think that that is going to eventually change you know i've spoken to a lot of different people when it comes to the price of silver being potentially manipulated lower by bullion banks, by a number of different players, depending on who you talk to, um, largely through paper futures contracts. How do you see all of that coming to an end? You know, I've, I've spoken to some people who say eventually they're just not going to be able to maintain it. And True price discovery will be kind of like an explosion, you know, as Doug Casey says, sucking the contents of the Hoover Dam, but putting it through a garden hose or, or sucking it through a straw. Um, what are your thoughts on how this all comes to an end, this, this price manipulation? Well, from what I've studied and researched and drawing heavily on experts in the field, you know, people like Mike Maloney, Peter Krauss, um, Peter Schiff, um, you, you look at the fundamentals. Um, silver is the most um, shorted commodity. Now, why do they pick on silver? I, I guess because it's a tiny, tiny market, so it's easier to push the price around. But what that has done over decades, uh, it's suppressed the mining of silver. You know, when, when silver is, it was $11, $12, $13, and it was around the cost of production then, what incentive was there for capital to risk you know, it's a huge risk researching a mine, get finding a geologist, finding a deposit, proving it, permitting it, infrastructure, energy, labor. It's an you know, it's a ten to fifteen year journey to bring the mine online. So, what incentive has there, has there been, even if there are huge deposits to to be found? And I doubt that with silver being an epithermal deposit, 
So, you know, that, that means when the earth was formed, um, it was at surface or near surface deposit. Um, so we do know factually uh, mines have been high grading, so they've been working through their more richer reserves to stay in business. And that's left all with less and less silver in it. And in, in a period of one and a half decades, the, the concentration of silver in the ore is halved. So now, in effect, that means twice as much energy, twice as much machinery and labor to, to produce the same amount of silver from the, from, from the ore. So this suppression price, eventually, it will cause a more dramatic rise, in my opinion, in the pricing of silver against everything else. You're a student of history, and, and we've spoken before that you think it's very important. History is a key component and, and an important lens to kind of view the gold and silver markets through today. What are some historical facts when it comes to gold and silver that you think investors and stackers should be should be aware of? Yeah, I mean, depends how far. I mean, let's limit it to a few centuries. Um, 1792, the U.S. Coinage Act. The dollar is defined as a Pacific weight of silver. Um, 1873, um, they had to reduce that, so they had to debase the dollar. So debasement is not a modern thing. They've been doing it um, with silver before we came off the silver standard. Um, 1816, England decided to come off the silver standard and go onto a gold standard. 1861, Germany did the same. Um, and then in between that, um, 1853, there was a debasement in the U.S. of the silver content of the of the of the coinage. Um, and as a consequence, I think of what happened in England and then in Germany. Uh, I think they came across to the U.S. and persuaded, bribed. I don't know what the conversations were. So we had the what was called at the time the Great. Uh, it was a great confiscation of wealth in 1873 because America went from a silver standard to a gold standard. And in that following 10 years, which was a period of mild, mild deflation because of increasing productivity and increased, you know, uh, lots of businesses starting, lots of um, entrepreneurs, you know, it was a thriving nation e economically. So we had mild deflation. Um, the people who held gold, their purchasing power doubled. So in 10 years after gold became money, uh, one of the reasons I think behind that was the bankers held the gold and the people held the silver. It was very rare for people to have a gold coin in their pocket. It was very unusual. And then you fast forward, so 1900 to 1933, the dollar was redeemable 100% for gold. You could take your $20 bill and receive your gold double eagle, just, just under one try ounce of gold. Um, so then 1933, Roosevelt did the uh, passed a law, but it was illegal to own gold over five ounces. Um, I don't think much was handed in by the public, um, hence why we have so many of the pre-33 gold coins now. What was the reason for that? Um uh, to, to allow the currency debasement because now only nations could redeem dollars for gold. So it restricted what the citizens of America could do. So every time the government gets involved in telling us what is and what isn't money, they steal wealth from the population. You, you have to work harder for longer and your purchasing power drops. And then 1935, finally, China and Hong Kong came off the silver standard. Um, so we've got this history, this pattern through history, which I think we can learn from. So what would the reverse happen if the people go back onto a personal silver standard? I fundamentally believe your wealth and your purchasing power will increase over time. It's reversing the process. I mean, obviously, we can't tell the Federal Reserve. We can't tell the U.S. Treasury, you must go onto a silver and gold. So that's just not going to happen. Um, it wouldn't be practical. The consequences, the chaos... Um, it would be horrific. So history really teaches us he who has this, the, the gold and the silver maintains and increases purchasing power. And this is what I fundamentally came to understand. 2017, that's when we personally started buying before we founded the business. And what we purchased then has doubled. So, okay, it's not, not crazy. But we don't have to sell that to cash in that rise. 
I believe, I fundamentally believe that rise, that 100 or 120% rise, is not going to evaporate and go away. That, per, that increase in purchasing power is only going to steadily increase, maybe dramatically increase from now on. Whereas if you look at almost every other financial asset, you have to sell it to cash in the gain. You have to try and guess the, guess the peak. And then you create a taxable amount. But silver, gold, it is fundamentally, it's got the most important, well, to me, the most fundamentally important definition of money is a store of value. So history tells us time and time again, the people who kept the silver and the gold kept their purchasing power. Very interesting thoughts there. Now, we are currently living through times that I think future historians will be writing stories about. I think there'll probably be documentaries, films made about what's happening in the world today. I'm wondering how much, in your opinion, geopolitics, global conflict, which we're obviously seeing a lot of these days, how much does that play a role in the gold and silver markets? And how do you expect these shifting geopolitical alliances to potentially affect silver, but all, maybe more specifically gold, as, as we see the BRICS nations kind of move further towards developing alliances, discuss creating some sort of alternate currency for trade, potentially backed by gold. How do you see all of that playing out? A lot of discussion about BRICS. Um, there's a lot of, um, I wouldn't even say theory, I'd say it, it, it was pre, it's pre-theory. A lot of people are predicting that that will cause the downfall of the dollar. Um, I, I differ on that point. One, China, the major player, it, it's a dictatorship. It's a one-man dic- rules the show. Anyone in China is too scared to bring Z real information to make sensible decisions. And the whole nature of this pseudo-communism top-down that one person knows best for 1.3 billion people is it's a myth. Communism will fail. It always does fail. Um, even if it was tried in a pure form, it will fail. It, it's, um, I, I fundamentally think um, when you try to plan equal outcomes, you have misallocation of resources, labor, energy, water, you, you name it. And China has squandered its resources. We have tens if not hundreds of millions of apartments which are supposed to be a financial asset which are worthless well they have used concrete steel labor water land um waste wasted it um so a key member of the so-called BRICS um group is fundamentally flawed economically um geographically china is struggling uh they've generally poor land so they're a great importer of food energy they have to import the bulk of their energy demographically they have a huge demographic crisis coming there is nothing coming for china in the medium term that is that is good i cannot see how they can develop their currency but to be to to even come close to challenging the dollar when economically um the best thing they can hope to do is to feed their population. And then Russia, another supposed key player. Well, its whole economy is about the size of Italy. I think it punches way above its weight. Um, I mean, we have yet to see the outcome of their uh, special operation in Ukraine. I think they stopped calling it that. We've yet to see that outcome. I don't think it's going to end well for Putin and his cronies. And again, we have a practical dictatorship in Russia. There is no real democracy. And as flawed as our US system is, I believe it is the best system in the world. Plenty of room for improvement, don't get me wrong. We make plenty of mistakes. But we do have a fair degree of democracy. There's a fair degree of free will, free speech, um, opportunity to create businesses, work hard, and and get on. I think that will win out. So the potential of a BRICS currency challenging the dollar, I just cannot see it happening. What I can see happening is we won't have a world reserve currency. We won't have a currency that's used as a world reserve. What we will have is a world res- a, a world currency, which will be the dollar, and then individuals, countries, businesses will choose their own reserves. And to a certain extent, that's a natural 
thing. You know, a thinking person with critical thinking, you'll look, how do I actually want to store wealth? Some people store it in fine art. Some people store it in real estate. Some people store it in farmland. Um, for the smaller purchaser, you know, less funds, the, the obvious to me is, is precious metals, is fundamentally... Um, you're completing what money should be by using different aspects. So the dollar is great. It's it's divisible, it's fungible, it's portable, it's universally acceptable. It doesn't depreciate overnight. Now, over years, yes. So as long as you're not holding it for more than a few months, to, the, the dollar is the perfect tool for trading with. So I, I just cannot see any challenge on, on the world scale to, to the dollar. I mean, 93% of all debts are written in dollar. China is only $1.3 trillion. Um, they've written, China relates loans in dollars when it's doing the Belt and Road Initiative. So those countries have to pay back in dollars. It is just a scale of it. Um, so I, I cannot see anything, anything ha happening there. So I think that's one of the major things we're going to see. The dictatorships are going to start failing more and more. You know, and I would include North Korea, Russia, China, Iran. Fundamentally, they've hollowed their countries out. They destroy ambition. They destroy individual thinking, entrepreneurship. Everything is crushed. Everything that is still good about America. You know, the American dream, much, much hard, but it's still alive and kicking. It will not die in America. And your thoughts on the global conflict's potential impact on the gold and silver price, because people sometimes look to gold, especially as you know, uh, a place where people run to in times of turmoil, in times of chaos. I've spoken to some people who actually believe a lot of the rise in the gold price was driven by these conflicts erupting around the world. Do you expect them to play a role, uh, maybe only if for the short term? Um, and I've also spoken to people who think we will see more conflict spreading around the world. You know, there's the potential for China-Taiwan conflict as well. Um, if that was to occur more hot wars, well, what do you think that would do um, in terms of the, the gold and silver markets? Let's speak to silver first. And um, that can only lead to further dis um, shortages in the supply of silver. I mean, the amount of silver using military and modern military equipment is just incredible. Cruise missiles, 500 ounces. I don't know how many hundreds or thousands of ounces there may be in a fighter jet or in a missile defense system. It, it, so the military industrial complex really is tooling up. I, I mean, we're having a great increase in the U.S. now as the U.S. realizes it's got to increase its homegrown munitions supply. That's just going to use, so practically, war is going to need lots lots and lots of silver. But on a human, on a human, uh, an individual uh, basis, People in times of crisis tend to flee what they perceive as safe and private. And silver and gold, in my opinion, are one of the few, if the only, practical safe and private stores of wealth. So with silver being such a tiny market, um, 800 million ounces mined, maybe 200 million recycled per year, it's a fraction of an ounce per person on the planet of silver is, is potentially available each year. So the tiniest move into silver will, will cause um, the structural deficit to become a, a, a crisis in physical supply. And then nations will have to choose, and I think they will choose, who gets the silver. So we could enter very rapidly, sorry, Mr. Public, you cannot buy silver anymore. We need it for the military. We need it for space. We need it for medical. We need it for national security. I, I can see that happening very, very rapidly. Uh, so, yeah, yes, wars, I think, we are going to have negatively have a positive uh, influence, strong influence on the uh, pricing of silver and gold. And, and I think last time I was on the show, I said gold had a long way to go. I think we'd seen some modern mo modest rises then. I still say it has a long, long way to go. And silver even more so. I mean, at the moment, was that... Was it one ounce of gold to 73 ounces of silver. I can see that. I can see that regressing to the, if not the mining ratio, to the, the previous monetary ratio. I, 
I can see that reverting to 15 to 1. So that's uh, nearly a five-fold increase in silver. And I think we will see that happen even as gold continues to rise. It seems that when it comes to the short-term price action of gold, markets often react to Fed policy, the expectation of future decisions from the Fed. There's a persistent idea out there that high interest rates are bad for gold because gold doesn't yield anything and people can park their cash in short-term treasuries, money market accounts, et cetera, make 5% plus. Um, But if the Fed cuts rates, that would be like rocket fuel for gold. Is it really that simple or, or is it more complicated than that in your view? I, I think it's way more complicated. And, and, I, and I think more and more people are realizing that the Fed is the emperor of no clothes, that they are mildly reactive to the situation. Um, you look at every recession we've entered into, it, 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 trouble really seems to start when they start cutting rates. It, it, it's... So if they think cutting rates can prevent a uh, d- depression or... <laughs> let, let me put it another way. Let me, in the biggest picture, the, the Federal Reserve, I think, was set up to by themselves to serve themselves. So I think it's a bit of a myth that they're there to stabilize things and make things better for the population. I think they know exactly which where where things are going and they are personally positioned they front run themselves i mean interestingly if you look um i think we just heard announced that the ceo of jp morgan is retiring and the ceo of another major bank is retiring uh, well that's a bit interesting isn't it that is sort of jump jumping ship now so sort of circling back to the federal reserve i i think if one or two percent of people wake up and realize who they are and what they are and what their mission is, you you just want to get out of the current financial system. Very interesting breakdown. Um, I do want to talk about something that Alistair McLeod has been saying a lot recently, and that is that the rise in the price of gold is actually a reflection of weakening fiat currency. It's not the price of gold going up, but fiat going down. I wonder if you see a similar connection between falling, you know, obviously rising inflation, which in many ways can be calculated as a falling value of the fiat currency used to buy those goods, um, and the rise of gold. And do you expect further inflation up ahead and for that to potentially cause more people to move to gold as a way to preserve their wealth? Okay, so your second to last point there, inflation. I think it's key to keep remembering what is inflation. Uh, and if you find a dictionary from the early 70s and you look up inflation, it will say the abnormal increase in monetary supply. We are still abnormally increasing the money supply. One trillion dollars every hundred days. That we know of. There may well be a bit more under the table. I, I, I don't know. So we have not finished with currency debasement. That carries on. Well, not indefinitely, but I think we have a few more years of that yet. yet. So that is definitely the debasement of the dollar will be reflected in precious metals. Uh, throughout history, um, what appears to be a dramatic move in the precious metals, I, I think as much as anything, is a surge in the rebalancing. So it, 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 it's often delayed um, for, for many reasons. I mean, one reason is a lot of people are just unaware of what money is. And they presume that their currency has the characteristics to store wealth. They presume that they are up their savings, their money market funds, their certificates of deposit, their IRAs, uh, their Roths are going to maintain their standard of living. So I think, yes, I would agree that it's a dollar falling, but I think there's more, there's a time delay in the precious metals given accounting. So what might appear as a surge and the recent surge, I mean, 40% in silver in three months, I, I would say we haven't even really got started yet. We're, 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 we're back about roughly where we were in 2021 in the when we touched $30. So if you inflation adjust that, we, we still haven't caught up with the currency debasement as where we stand. So I'll repeat for gold, it's a, long, it's a long way to go yet. And silver, 
potentially five times further than than, than gold. Um, so yes, the dollar does losing its purchasing power, but I think the the, the delay in people realizing and coming to a conclusion and that that human action, that human realization can happen, does happen very, very quickly from virtually very little interest to everything is sold out retail. That, that can happen in hours. Well, that's a perfect segue into my next question because multiple people I've spoken to have said that Western participation in the gold and silver space when it comes to buying physical is very low. We're seeing outflows from gold ETFs as well. Um, and that most of the current retail participation is coming from the East. I talked to Steve Hankey recently. He pointed out that China is one of the main drivers, Chinese retail buying. I've talked to other people who say India is also a major driver. Um, what are you seeing from your perspective as a bullion dealer? Are, are you seeing a lot of gold and silver buyers on your end? And do you think that as kind of the zeitgeist changes and more and more people wake up to the debasement of the currency, like you said, that can happen all at once. Could Western participation, greater participation in the in the market potentially be the next catalyst for gold and silver prices? Absolutely for silver. It's it's hard to comprehend how tiny the silver market is. When you translate the, to the total production and recycling into dollars, you're into 30, 30 billion. 32 billion, if it was all available for investment. Well, we, we work in a town called Jackson in Wyoming. There's probably 50 people within a mile of where I am who could write a check for $32 billion. <laughs> so one person could bring this to an end. They could say they could... Uh, they could get a consultant say, buy me all the physical steel that is available. Uh, I mean, obviously, that would be a complex operation because you, uh, it's the word, it's a very small industry. The wholesalers know each other. The big dealers know each other. The word gets around. If somebody makes a big purchase, um, you know, we've had hints of this. We've had, you know, somebody bought $50 million in silver uh, a year or so ago. Earlier this year, the largest U.S. wholesaler sold nearly two months of its allocation of um, silver eagles to one client through a bank. So we're starting to get ripples of this. Um, so uh, I don't want to get a bit lost off track here, but the awareness, I think, is growing. I think we are months, maybe six months away from there being no actual retail silver available because there's such a tiny amount there. Just a few, one incredibly wealthy people could wake up or, or a million modestly wealthy people could wake up and decide, do you know what? I'm out of the fiat dollar game for now. I want to, I want to take my profits off the table. I want to park them in something safe, private, secure. Um, so I, I can see that happening. We're seeing that. We've got some very savvy buyers. Some of them have been buying for 60 or 70 years. They're still buying heavily. We've got recent buyers new to it. They're literally putting 90% of their wealth into silver. Um, now, is that anecdotal from us, one dealer? I, I, I don't know. I don't personally talk to other dealers. <laughs> but my... Hunch is, my gut feeling is we are close to a realization that if you want to keep your purchasing power, you don't want to park it in dollars or instruments, dollar denominated instruments. Um, new, new time buyers, yeah, we, we're seeing all demographics. So having an inter interesting discussions with people who come to the same realization that, that, that I did seven, eight years ago, more and more people are coming to that conclusion. So I think, yeah, the U.S. is is supposedly the wealthiest nation in the world. If just a fraction of a percent of people's checking uh, savings accounts went into silver, it would all be sold out. And for those new to stacking gold and silver, what are some of the most important factors they should keep in mind when deciding what to purchase? When you, when you meet someone who is just entering the market, what, what are some pointers maybe you give them and, and what things should they be looking out for? 
So first, I like to find out what someone's objectives and timescales are. If this is money, money currency, they want to turn into permanent wealth storage, um, look for the lowest premiums. So that would lend you more to the, the, to the, the special deals that are out there. At the moment, premiums are very compressed, so it does simplify the choice. If the premiums are very close from a one-ounce round to a 100-ounce bar, buy the one-ounce rounds. Um, they're going to be more easily sold on and more desirable in, in the future. Um, if you're more, this is some of my rainy day funds, I might need it in six months. I'm in a year, I might want to buy a car. You know, I, I've got people who put pretty well all of their dollars into silver because they want to build a, a workshop in two years' time. And they know that their dollars will not buy the same amount of concrete, steel, and um, lumber. Uh, so they want to store their purchasing power. So it will depend on your potential exit plan, your objectives. Um, so if, if you've got a mixed time scale, you might think, well, in a year, two years, I might want to sell a bit. Then it's interesting to get a selection. I mean, at the moment, you can get sovereign coins at a very good premium. They're always useful because they're known, got great security features, and there's a high chance you're actually going to get, get some of your premium back when you sell. So it does depend on time scale. Um, avoid high premium products. I would say pretty well avoid the American Eagle. I think we're at that tipping point. The premium has just gone too high to make it sensible. Um, switch to a Maple or a Britannia. Um, but there are plenty of bargains out there, and the bargains will continue as spot rises because it's bringing some people are cashing out into that. So there are plenty of close to spot deals at the moment. Well, let's shift over to osmium for a moment here. Um, this is a very fascinating precious metal that not a lot of people are aware of. Um, we spoke about it a little bit more in our last interview, so people can go back and watch that. I'm also working with the Osmium Institute to make a documentary on Osmium. So definitely people can stay tuned if they want to learn all the details of that metal. But for now, there have been some exciting developments in the Osmium space since we last talked. So fill us in on what's happening there. Yeah, so just a very, very brief overview. It took a Swiss scientist four decades to vapor crystallize Osmium into a form that is not only safe, it's incredibly beautiful and incredibly durable. Uh, I don't know if the camera is a little piece where that will pick up some of the cycle. So this is a piece of vapor crystallized osmium in bar form. It's 595, so it's 99.9995% pure. Incredibly rare in the natural byproduct from platinum mining. Um, it's recently been found out by the Osmium Institute who have been scouring the world for 10 years to buy any ethically produced Osmium. They've realized it's actually a lot rarer than was previously thought. So they've accumulated 300 kilos of ethically produced Osmium that they are confident was produced w without killing people, basically, <laughs> and, and ethically. Um, so the Swiss scientists who took took him 40 years with many accidents and near-death experiences, uh, he's decided he's retiring at the end of 2026. So their timescale now is they will crystallize the 300 kilos that took them 10 years to accumulate, and then there will be no more raw osmium turned into this crystalline form. So we now know that the Osmium Institute, who are uh, the only... Uh, supplier, so they cut, certify, and register on the world database every piece of crystallized osmium. We now know there will only be 350 kilos total. So around 30 kilos they've produced and sold, 20 kilos in inventory, and a further 300 kilos. So I just found out today that in four to six weeks' time there will be a price increase as they are now trying to temper the demand. So they're trying to pace with by pricing. They don't want to sell out too quickly. So literally they are adjusting the price to, to keep their inventories at a fairly steady level as we go forward. Also, 
Uh, they spent 10 years marketing and advertising. They're in 42 countries. Uh, we are the first retailer in the US. So some major luxury brands are now um, interested in talking um, about using it. Uh, a major sports personality and a major music personality literally today are in serious discussions. So when one or many of these pick the product up, uh, and awareness, people become aware of what it is and its fundamental characteristics and why it is the ultimate precious metal, um, we, we're going to see some great price action. Very interesting. And you are, I believe, the only uh, certified osmium dealer in the United States. So people can go to Arc Silver Gold Osmium to check out some pieces there. Uh, this has been a fantastic conversation, Ian. Why don't we end on uh, telling us about Arc SGO, what it is you do there, I'm going to put a link in the description below to arcsgo.com. People can email you at ian at arcsgo.com. And um, I'll put your phone number on the screen as well. ArcSGO is a sponsor of this show, which we greatly appreciate. Um, so tell us about Arc Silver Gold Osmium. So we were founded out of conversations, out of talking to people. When I discovered the difference between money and currency and the importance of storing your wealth privately and safely, people would start buying precious metals. So we are passionate about talking to people, whether they buy from us in the end or not. Um, I just think everybody should um, be thinking about how they preserve their principle. For so long in America, we've done great. America has done great on getting return on principle, and there's always been the presumption you'll get return off your principle. We are entering dangerous times now where you may carry on getting return on your principal, but that will be in dollars in the currency that has less and less purchasing power. With a uh, not insignificant risk of losing or having trapped your principal, you know, certain financial progress could get compulsory converted to US debt. Uh, the term could get extended to 100 years or even perpetual, so you'd get the coupon you'd never get your principal back. So we, we really specialize. We really want to know to as much degree as a client, potential client will tell us what their circumstances are, what their objectives are, and in what their personal preferences are. And then we really aim to tailor to the best we can what products suit their personal circumstances, their existing holdings, and their time scale. And we will spend as long as it takes. I mean, we've not not been on that four hour conversations um, bef before we, we can help people um, come to the place where they're happy to make make their decision with as much information as they need and if they need more information we will bend over backwards to to fi find that information and uh, transmit it to them fantastic well i'll put a link to the website below as i said you can call ian directly or email him that information will be on screen right now from the people i've spoken to that have done business with you it's all rave reviews calling you one of the most honest precious metal dealers out there so highly recommend you get in touch with ian if you have precious metals needs ian thank you once again for coming on and i'm looking forward to the next time we can have a conversation thank you jesse Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.